of means and ends. We cannot think first and act afterwards. From the moment of birth, we are immersed in action and can only fitfully guide it by taking thought. Alfred North Whitehead. That perennial question, does the end justify the means, is meaningless as it stands. The real and only question regarding the ethics of means and ends is, and always has been, does this particular end justify this particular means? Life and how you live it is the story of means and ends. The end is what you want, and the means is how you get it. Whenever we think about social change, the question of means and ends arises. The man of action views the issue of means and ends in pragmatic and strategic terms. He has no other problem. He thinks only of his actual resources and the possibilities of various choices of action. He asks only of whether they are achievable and worth the cost. Of means, only whether they will work. To say that corrupt means corrupt, the ends is to believe in the immaculate conception of ends and principles. The real arena is corrupt and bloody. Life is a corrupting process from the time a child learns to play his mother off against his father in the politics of when to go to bed. They who fear corruption fear life. The practical revolutionary will understand Goethe's conscience is the virtue of observers and not of agents of action. In action, one does not only enjoy the luxury of a decision that is consistent both with one's individual conscience and the good of mankind. The choice must always be for the latter. Action is for mass salvation and not for the individual's personal salvation. He who sacrifices the mass good for his personal conscience has a particular conception of personal salvation. They don't care enough for the people to be corrupted for them. The men who pile up the heaps of discussion and lecture on the ethics of means and ends, which, with rare exception, is conspicuous for its sterility, rarely write about their own experiences in the perpetual struggle of life and change. They're strangers, moreover, to the burdens and problems of operational responsibility and the unceasing pressure for immediate decisions. They are passionately committed to a mystical objectivity where passions are suspect. They assume a non-existent situation where men dispassionately and with reason draw and devise means and ends as if studying a navigational chart on land. They can be recognized by one of two verbal brands. We agree with the ends, but not the means. Or, this is not the time. The means and end moralists, or non-doers, always wind up on their ends without any means. The means and end moralists, constantly obsessed with the ethics of the means used by the have-nots against the haves, should search themselves as to their real political position. In fact, they are passive, but real allies of the haves. They are the only ones Jacques Martin referred to in his statement, the fear of soiling ourselves by entering the context of history is not virtue, but a way of escaping virtue. These non-doers were the ones who chose not to fight the Nazis in the only way they could have been fought. They were the ones who drew their windows blinds sh to shut out the shameful spectacle of Jews and political prisoners being dragged through the streets. They were the ones who privately deplored the horror of it all and did nothing. This is the nadir of immor uh, immorality. The most unethical of all means is the non-use of any means. It is this species of man who so vehemently and militantly participated in that classically idealistic debate at the old League of Nations on the ethical differences between defense and offensive weapons. Their fears of action drive them to, re uh, to refuge in an ethic so divorced from the politics of life that it can apply only to angels, not of men. The standards of judgment must be rooted in the whys and wherefores of life as it is lived, the world as it is, not for our wished-for fantasy of the world as it should be. I present here a series of rules pertaining to the ethics of means and ends. First, that one's concern with the ethics of means and ends varies inversely with one's personal interest in the issue. 
When we're not directly concerned, our morality overflows. As Roquefort uh, uh, call um, put it, we all have strength enough to endure the misfortunes of others. Accompanying this rule is the parallel one that one's concern with the ethics of means and ends varies inversely with one's distance from the scene of a conflict. The second rule of ethics, means and ends, is that the judgment of the ethics of means is dependent upon the political position of those sitting in judgment. If you actively oppose the Nazi occupation and join the underground resistance, then you adopted the means of assassination, terror, property destruction, the bombing of tunnels and trains, kidnapping, the willingness to sacrifice innocent hostages to the end of defeating the Nazis. Those who opposed the Nazi conquerors regarded the resistance as a secret army of selfless, patriotic idealists, courageous beyond expectation, and willing to sacrifice their lives to their moral convictions. To the occupation authorities, however, these people were lawless terrorists, murderers, saboteurs, assassins who believed that the end justified the means and were utterly unethical according to the mystical rules of war. Any foreign occupation would so ethically judge its opposition. However, in such conflict, neither protagonist is concerned with any value except victory. It is life or death. To us, the Declaration of Independence is a glorious document and an affirmation of human rights. To the British, on the other hand, it was a statement notorious for its deceit by omission. In the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Particulars, attesting to the reasons for the revolution, cited all of the injustices which the colonists felt that England had been guilty of, but listed none of the benefits. There was no mention of the food the colonies had received during the British Empire during times of famine, medicine during times of disease, soldiers during times of war with indigenous and other foes, or the many other direct and indirect aids to the survival of the colonies. Neither was there notice of the growing number of allies and friends of the colonists in the British House of Commons, and the hope for eminent remedial legislation to correct the inequities under, the, uh, under which the colonials suffered. Jefferson, Franklin, and others were honorable men, but they knew the Declaration of Independence was a call to war. They also knew that a list of many of the constructive benefits of the British Empire to the colonists would have so diluted the urgency of the call to arms for the revolution as it to be self-defeating. The result might have well been a document attesting to the fact that justice weighed down the scale at least 60% on our side and only 40% on their side. And that because of the 20% difference, we were going to have a revolution. To expect a man to leave his wife, his children, his home, to leave his crops standing in the field and pick up a gun and join the revolutionary army for a 20% difference in the balance of human justice was to defy common sense. The Declaration of Independence as a declaration of war had to be what it was a 100% statement of the justice of the cause of the colonialists and a 100% denunciation of the role of the British government as evil and unjust. Our cause had to be all shining justice allied with the angels. Theirs had to be all evil tied to the devil. In no war has the enemy or the cause ever been gray. Therefore, from one point of view, the omission was justified. From the other, it was deliberate deceit. History is made up of moral judgments based on politics. We condemned Lenin's acceptance of money from the Germans in 1917, but were discreetly silent while our Colonel William B. Thompson in the same year contributed a million dollars to the anti-Bolsheviks in Russia. As allies of the Soviets in World War II, we praised and cheered communist guerrilla tactics when the Russians used them against the Nazis during the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. We denounce the same tactics when they're used by communist forces in different parts of the world against us. The opposition's means used against us are always immoral, and our means are always ethical and rooted in the highest of values. George Bernard Shaw in Man and Superman pointed out that the variations in ethical definitions by virtue of where you stand. Mendoza said to Tanner, quote, I am a brigand. I live by robbing the rich. Tanner replied, I'm a gentleman. 
I live by robbing the poor. Shake hands. The third rule of the ethics of means and ends is that in war, the end justifies almost any means. Agreements on the Geneva rules of treatment of prisoners or use of nuclear weapons are observed only because the enemy or his potential allies may retaliate. Winston Churchill's remarks to his private secretary a few hours before the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union graphically pointed out the politics of means and ends in war. Informed of the eminent turn of events, the secretary inquired how Churchill, the leading British anti-communist, could reconcile himself to be on the same side as the Soviets. Would not Churchill find it embarrassing and difficult to ask his government to support the communists? Churchill's reply was clear and unequivocal. Not at all. I have only one purpose, the destruction of Hitler, and my life is much simplified thereby. If Hitler invaded hell, I would at least make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. In the Civil War, President Lincoln did not hesitate to, sus uh, to suspend the right of habeas corpus and to ignore the directive of the Chief Justice of the United States. Again, when Lincoln was convinced that the use of military commissions to try civilians was necessary, he brushed aside the illegality of this action with the statement that it was indispensable to public safety. He said that the civil courts were powerless to cope with the insurrectionist activities of civilians. Must I, quote, must I shoot a simple, sorry, must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts while I must not touch a hair of a wily agitator who induces him to desert? The fourth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that judgment must be made in the context of the times in which the action occurred and not from any other chronological vantage point. The Boston Massacre is a case in point. British atrocities alone, however, were not sufficient to convince the people that murder had been done on the night of March 5th. There was a deathbed confession of Patrick Carr that the townspeople had been the aggressors and the soldiers had fired in self-defense. This unlooked-for recantation from one of the martyrs who was dying in the odor of sanctity with which Sam Adams had vested them sent a wave of alarm through the Patriot ranks. But Adams blasted Carr's testimony in the eyes of all pious New Englanders by pointing out that he was an Irish papist who had probably died in the confession of the Roman Catholic Church. After Sam Adams had finished with Patrick Carr, even Tories did not dare to quote him to prove Bostonians were responsible for the massacre. To the British, this was a false, rotten use of bigotry and an immoral means characteristic of the revolutionary or the sons of liberty. To the Sons of Liberty and to the Patriots, Sam Adams' actions was brilliant strategy and a God-sent lifesaver. Today, we may look back and regard Adams' action in the same light as the British did. But remember, we're not today involved in the revolution against the British Empire. Ethical standards must be elastic to stretch with the times. In politics, the ethics of means and ends can be understood by the rules suggested here. History is made up of little else but examples such as our position on freedom of the high seas in 1812 and 1917 contrasted with our 1962 blockade of Cuba or our alliance in 1942 with the Soviet Union against Germany, Japan, and Italy with the reversal, uh, reversal in alignments in less than a decade. Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus his defiance of a directive of the Chief Justice of the United States and the illegal use of military commissions to try civilians were by the same man who had said in Springfield 15 years earlier, quote, Let me not be understood as saying that there are no bad laws or that grievances may not arise from the redress of which no legal provisions have been made. I mean to say no such thing, but I do mean to say that although bad laws, if they exist, should be repealed, still, while they continue in force for the sake of example, they should be religiously observed. This was also the same Lincoln who, a few years prior to his signing the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation, stated in his first inaugural address, quote, 
I do but quote from one of those speeches when I declared that I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no a lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Those who nominated and elected me did so with full knowledge that I made this and many similar declarations and have never recanted them. Those who would be critical of the ethics of Lincoln's reversal of positions have a strangely unreal picture of a static, unchanging world where one remains firm and committed to certain so-called principles or positions. In the politics of human life, consistency is not a virtue. To be consistent means, according to the Oxford Universal Dictionary, standing still or not moving. Men must change with the times or die. The change in Jefferson's orientation when he became president is pertinent to this point. Jefferson had incessantly attacked President Washington for using national self-interest as the point of departure for all decisions. He castigated the president as narrow and selfish and argued the decisions should be made on a world interest basis to encourage the spread of ideas of the American Revolution. That Washington's adherence to the criteria of national self-interest was a betrayal of the American Revolution. However, from the first moment when Jefferson assumed the presidency of the United States, his every decision was dictated by national self-interest. This story from another century has parallels in our century and every other. The fifth rule of the ethics of means and ends is the concern with ethics increases with the number of means available and vice versa. To the man of action, the first criterion in determining which means to employ is to assess which means are available. Reviewing and selecting available means is done on a straight utilitarian basis. Will it work? Moral questions may enter when one chooses among equally effective alternative means. But if one lacks the luxury of a choice and is possessed of only one means, then the ethical question never arises. Automatically, the lone means becomes endowed with a moral spirit. Its defense lies in the cry, what else could I do? Inversely, the secure position in which one possesses the choice of a number of effective and powerful means is always accompanied by that ethical concern and serenity of conscience so admirably described by Mark Twain as the calm confidence of a Christian holding four aces. To me, ethics is doing what is best for the most. During a conflict with a major corporation, I was confronted with the threat of public exposure of a photograph of a motel Mr. and Mrs. registration and photographs of my girl and myself. I said, go ahead and give it to the press. I think she's beautiful and I've never claimed to be celibate, so go ahead. That ended the threat. Almost on the heels of this encounter, one of the corporation's minor executives came to see me. It turned out... He was a secret sympathizer with our side. Pointing to his briefcase, he said, In there is plenty of proof that so-and-so, leader of the opposition, prefers boys to girls. I said, thanks, but forget it. I don't fight that way. I don't fight that way. I don't want to see it. Goodbye. He protested, but they just tried to hang you on that girl. I replied, the fact that they fight that way doesn't mean I have to. To me, dragging a person's private life into this muck is loathsome and nauseous. He left. So far, so noble. But if I had been convinced that the only way we could win was to use it, then without any reservations, I would have used it. What was my alternative? To draw myself up into a righteous moral indignation saying, I would rather lose than corrupt my principles and then go home with my ethical hymen intact? The fact that 40,000 poor would lose their war against hopelessness and despair was just too tragic. That their, that their condition would be even worsened by the vindictiveness of the corporation was also terrible and unfortunate. But that's life. After all, one has to remember means and ends. It's true that I might have trouble getting to sleep because it might take time to tuck those big angelic moral wings under the covers. To me, 
That would be utter immorality. The sixth rule of the ethics of means and ends is the less important the end to be desired, the more one can afford to engage in ethical evaluations of means. No explanation. I'll read it again for you. The sixth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that the less important the end to be desired, the more one can afford to engage in ethical evaluation of means. The seventh rule of the ethics of means and ends is that generally success or failure is a mighty determinant of ethics. The judgment of history leans heavily on the outcome of success or failure. It spells the difference between the traitor and the patriotic hero. There can be no such thing as a successful traitor. For if one succeeds, he becomes a founding father. The eighth rule of the ethics and means and ends is that morality of a means depends upon whether the means is being employed at a time of imminent defeat or imminent victory. The same means employed with victory seemingly assured may be defined as immoral, whereas if it had been used in desperate circumstances to avert defeat, the question of morality would likely never arise. In short, Ethics are determined by whether one is losing or winning. From the beginning of time, killing has always been regarded as justifiable if committed in self-defense. Let us confront this principle with the most awful ethical question of modern times. Did the United States have the right to use the atomic bomb at Hiroshima? When we dropped the atomic bomb, the United States was assured victory. In the Pacific, Japan had suffered an unbroken succession of defeats. Now we were in Okinawa with an air base from which we could bomb the en enemy around the clock. The Japanese Air Force was decimated, as was their Navy. Victory had come in Europe, and the entire European Air Force, Navy, and Army were released for use in the Pacific. Russia was moving in for a cut of the spoils. Defeat for Japan was an absolute certainty, and the only question was how and when the coup de grace would be administered. For familiar reasons, we dropped the bomb and triggered off as well as a universal debate on the morality of use of this means for the end of finishing the war. I submit that if the atomic bomb had de been developed shortly after Pearl Harbor when we stood defensiveless, when most of our Pacific fleet was at the bottom of the seas, when the nation was fearful of invasion on the Pacific coast, when we were committed as well to the war in Europe, that then the use of the bomb at that time on Japan would have been universally heralded as a just retribution of hail, fire, and brimstone. Then the use of the bomb would have been hailed as proof that good inevitably triumphs over evil. The question of the ethics of the use of the bomb would never have arisen at the time, and the character of the present debate would have been very different. Those who would disagree with this assertion have no memory of the state of the world at that time. They're either fools or liars or both. The ninth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that any effective means is automatically judged by the opposition as being unethical. One of our greatest revolutionary heroes was Francis Marion of South Carolina, who became immortalized in American history as the Swamp Fox. Marion was an outright revolutionary guerrilla. He and his men operated according to the traditions and with all of the tactics commonly associated with the present-day guerrillas. Cornwallis and the regular British army found their plans and operations harried and disorganized by Marion's guerrilla tactics. Infuriated by the effectiveness of his operations and incapable of coping with them, the British denounced him as a criminal and charged him uh, and charged that he did not engage in warfare like a gentleman or a Christian. He was subjected to an unremitting denunciation about his lack of ethics and morality for his use of guerrilla means to the end of winning the revolution. The tenth rule of the ethics of means and ends is that you do what you can with what you have and clothe it in moral garments. In the field of action, the first question that arises in the determination of means to be employed for particular ends is what means are available. 
This requires an assessment of whatever strengths or resources are present and can be used. It involves sifting the multiple factors which combine in creating the circumstances at any given time and an adjustment to the popular views and popular climate. Questions such as how much time is necessary or available must be considered. Who and how many will support the actions? Does the opposition possess the power to the degree that it can suspend or change laws? Does it control the police power to extend to the point where legal and orderly change is impossible? If weapons are needed, then are appropriate weapons available? Availability of means determines whether you will be underground or above ground, whether you will move quickly or slowly, whether you will move for extensive changes or limited adjustments, whether you will move by passive resistance or active resistance, or whether you will move at all. The absence of any means might drive one to martyrdom in the hope that this would be a catalyst starting a chain reaction that would culminate in a mass movement. Here, a simple ethical statement is used as a means to power. A naked illustration of this point is to be found in Trotsky's summary of Lenin's fa famous April Theses, issued shortly after Lenin's return from exile. Just in there. Lenin pointed out, the task of the Bolsheviks is to overthrow the imperialist government. But this government rests upon the support of the social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, who in turn are supported by the trustfulness of the masses of people. We are in the minority. In these circumstances, there can be no talk of violence on our side. The essence of Lenin's speeches during this period was they have the guns and therefore we are for peace and are for reformation through the ballot. When we have the guns, then we'll be through the bullet. And it was. Mahatma Gandhi and his use of passive resistance in India presents a striking example of selection of means. Here, too, we see the inevitable alchemy of time working upon moral equivalence as a consequence of the changing circumstances and positions of the have-nots to the haves, with a natural shift of goals from getting to keeping. Gandhi is viewed by the world as the epitome of the highest moral character with respect to means and ends. We can assume that there are those who would believe that if Gandhi had lived, there would never have been an invasion of Goa or any other armed invasion. Similarly, the politically naive would have regarded it as unbelievable that the great apostle of nonviolence, Nehru, would ever have countenanced the invasion of Goa. For it was Nehru who stated in 1955, what are the basic elements of our policy in regard to Goa? First, there must be peaceful methods. This is essential unless we give up the roots of all of our policies and our behavior. We rule out non-peaceful methods entirely. He was a man committed to nonviolence and extensively to the love of mankind, including his enemies. His end was the independence of India from foreign domination and his means was that of passive resistance. History and religious and moral opinion have so enshrined Gandhi in this sacred matrix that in many quarters it's blasphemous to question whether this entire procedure of passive resistance was not simply the only intelligent, realistic, expedient program which Gandhi had at his disposal. And that the morality which surrounded this policy of passive resistance was to a large degree a rationale to cloak a pragmatic program with a desired and essential moral cover. Let us examine this case first. Gandhi, like any other leader in the field of social action, was compelled to examine the means at hand. If he had had guns, he might as well have used them in an armed revolution against the British, which would have been in keeping with the traditions of revolutions for, three, for freedom through force. Gandhi did not have the guns, and if he had had the guns, he would not have had the people to use the guns. Gandhi records in his autobiography his astonishment at the passivity and the submissiveness of his people in not retaliating or even wanting revenge against the British. Quote, As I proceeded further and further with my inquiry into the atrocities that had been committed on my people, I came across tales of government's tyranny and the arbitrary despotism of its officers such as I was hardly prepared for, and they filled me with deep pain. What surprised me then, and what still continues to fill me with surprise, was the fact that a province that had furnished the largest number of soldiers to the British government during the war should have taken all these brutal excesses lying down. 
Gandhi and his associates repeatedly deplored the inability of their people to give organized, effective, violent resistance against injustice and tyranny. His own experience was corroborated by an unbroken series of uh, reiterations from all the leaders of India that India could not practice physical warfare against her enemies. Many reasons were given, including weakness, lack of arms, having been beaten into submission, and other arguments of a similar nature. When interviewed by Norman Cousins in 1961, Nehru described the Hindus of those days as, quote, a demoralized, timid, and hopeless mass bullied and crushed by every dominant interest and incapable of resistance. Faced with this situation, we revert for the moment to Gandhi's assessment and review of the means available to him. It has been stated that if he had, been the, if he had had the guns, he might have used them. This statement is based on the Declaration of Independence of Mahatma Gandhi issued on January 26, 1930, where he discussed, quote, the fourfold disaster to our country. His fourth indictment against the British reads, quote, Spiritually compulsory disarmament has made us unmanly, and the presence of an alien army of occupation employed with deadly, deadly effect to crush us in the spirit of resistance has made us think we cannot look after ourselves or put up a defense against foreign aggression or even defend our homes and families. These words more than suggest that if Gandhi had had the weapons for violent resistance and the people to use them, this means would not have so unreservedly rejected as the world would like to have think. On the same point, we might note that once India had secured independence, when Nehru was faced with a dispute with Pakistan over Kashmir, he did not hesitate to use armed force. Now that the power arrangements had changed, India had the guns and the trained army to use weapons. Any suggestion that Gandhi would not have approved the use of violence is negated by Nehru's own statement in a 1961 interview. Quote, It was a terrible time when the news reached me about Kashmir. I knew I would have to act at once with force. Yet, I was greatly troubled in mind and spirit because I knew we might have to face a war. So soon after having achieved our independence through a philosophy of nonviolence, it was horrible to think of, yet I acted. Gandhi said nothing to indicate his disapproval. It was a great relief, I must say. If Gandhi, the vigorous nonviolent, didn't demur, it made my job, job a lot easier. This strengthened my view that Gandhi could be adaptable. Confronted with the issue that of what means he could employ against the British, we come to the other criteria previously mentioned, that the kind of means selected and how they can be used is significantly dependent upon the face of the enemy or the character of the opposition. Gandhi's opposition not only had made effective use of passive resistance possible, but practically invited it. His enemy was a British administration characterized by an old, aristocratic, liberal tradition, one which granted a good deal of freedom to its colonials, and which had always operated on a pattern of using, absorbing, seducing, or destroying through flattery or corruption. The revolutionary leaders who arose from the colonial ranks. This was the kind of opposition that would have tolerated and ultimately capitulated before the tactic of passive resistance. Gandhi's passive resistance would never have had a chance against a totalitarian state such as that of the Nazis. It's dubious whether under these circumstances the idea of passive resistance would have even occurred to, to Gandhi. It has been pointed out that Gandhi, who was born in 1869, never saw or understood totalitarianism and defined his opposition completely in terms of the character of the British government and what it represented. George Orwell, Eric Blair, in his essay, Reflection on Gandhi, made some pertinent observations on this point. Quote, He believed in arousing the world, which is only possible if the world gets a chance to hear what you are doing. It is difficult to see how Gandhi's methods could be applied in a country where opponents of the regime disappear in the middle of the night and are never heard from again. Without a free press and the right of assembly, it is impossible not merely to appeal to outside opinions, but to bring a mass movement into being, or even to make your intentions known to your adversary. 
From a pragmatic point of view, passive resistance was not only possible, but it was the most effective means that could have been selected for the end of ridding, uh, ridding India of British control. In organizing, the major of neg uh, negative in the situation has, been, uh, has, <laughs> has to be converted into the leading positive. In short, Knowing that one could not expect violent action from this large and torpid mass, Gandhi organized the inertia. He gave it a goal so that it became purposeful. Their wide familiarity with Dharma made passive resistance no stranger to the Hindustani. To oversimplify, what Gandhi did was to say, look, you're all sitting there anyway, so instead of sitting there, why don't you sit over here? And while you're sitting there, say independence now. This raises another question about the morality of means and ends. We've already noted that in, the, in, that in essence, mankind defines itself into three groups. The have-nots, the have-a-little-want-mores, and the haves. The purpose of the haves is to keep what they have. Therefore, the haves want to maintain the status quo and the have-nots to change it. The haves develop their own morality to justify their means of repression and all other means employed to maintain the status quo. The haves usually establish laws and judges devoted to maintaining that status quo, since any effective means of changing the status quo are usually illegal and or unethical in the eyes of the establishment. Have-nots, from the beginning of time, have been compelled to appeal to a higher law than man-made law. Then, when the have-nots achieve success and become the haves, they're in the position of trying to keep what they have, and their morality shifts with their change of location and power pattern. Eight months after securing independence, the Indian National Congress outlawed passive resistance and made it a crime. It was one thing for them to use the means of passive resistance against the previous haves, but now in power they were going to ensure that this means would not be used against them. No longer as have-nots were they appealing to laws higher than man-made laws. Now that they were making the laws, they were on the side of man-made laws. Hunger strikes, used so effectively in the revolution, were viewed differently now, too. Nehru, in the interview mentioned above, said... The government will not be influenced by hunger strikes. To tell the truth, I didn't approve of fasting as a political weapon, even when Gandhi uh, practiced it. Again, Sam Adams, the firebrand radical of the American Revolution, provides a clear example. Adams was foremost in procla uh, proclaiming the right of revolution. However, Following the success of the American Revolution, it was the same Sam Adams who was foremost in demanding the execution of those Americans who participated in the Shea Rebellion, charging that no one has the right to engage in revolution against us. Moral rationalization is indispensable at all times of action, whether to justify the selection or the use of ends or means. Machiavelli's blindness to the necessity for moral clothing to all acts and motives, he said, quote, politics has no relation to morals. That was his major weakness. All great leaders, including Churchill, Gandhi, Lincoln, and Jefferson, always invoked moral principles to cover naked self-interest in the clothing of freedom, equality of mankind, a law higher than man-made laws, and so on and so forth. Then even held under circumstances of national crises when it was universally assumed that the end justify any means. All effective actions require the passport of morality. The examples are everywhere. In the United States, the rise of the civil rights movement in the late 1950s was marked by the use of passive resistance in the South against segregation. Violence in the South would have been suicidal. Political pressure was then impossible. The only recourse was economic pressure with a few fringe activities. Legally blocked by state laws, hostile police, and courts, they were compelled, like all have-nots from time immemorial, to appeal to a law higher than man-made laws. In his social contract, Rousseau noted the obvious that, quote, law is a very good thing for men with property and a very bad thing for men without property. 
Passive resistance remained one of the few means available to anti-segregationist forces until they had secured the voting franchise, in fact. Furthermore, passive resistance was also a good defensive tactic since it curtailed the opportunities for use of power resources of the status quo for forcible repression. Passive resistance was chosen for, this, uh, chosen for the same pragmatic reason that all tactics are selected, but it assumes the necessary moral and religious adornments. However, when passive resistance becomes massive and threatening, it gives birth to violence. Southern Negroes have no tradition of Dharma and are close enough to their northern compatriots so that contrasting conditions between the north and south are as visible as well as a constant spur. Add to this fact that the Southerners' poor whites do not operate by British tradition but reflect generations of violence. The future does not argue for making a special religion of nonviolence. It will be remembered for what it was, the best tactic for its time and place. As more effective means became available, the civil rights movement will divest itself of those decorations and substitute a new moral philosophy in keeping with its new means and opportunities. The explanation will be as it always has been. Times have changed. It's happening today. The 11th rule of the ethics of means and ends is that goals must be phrased in terms like liberty, equality, fraternity of the common welfare, pursuit of happiness, or bread and peace. Whitman put it, the goal once named cannot be countermanded. It has been previously noted that the wise man of action knows that frequently in the stream of action of means towards ends, whole new and unexpected ends are among the major results of the action. From a civil war fought as a means to preserve the union came the end of slavery ish not really in this connection it must be remembered that history is made up of actions in which one end results in another ends repeatedly scientific discoveries have resulted from experimental research committed to ends or objectives that have little relationship with the discoveries work on a seemingly minor practical program has resulted in feedbacks of major creative ideas. J.C. Flugel notes in Man, Morals, and Society that, quote, in psychology too, we have no right to be astonished of it. If, while dealing with a means, example, the cure of a neurotic symptom, the discovery of more efficient ways of learning, or the relief of industrial fatigue, we find that we have modified our attitude towards the end, acquired some new insight into the nature of mental health, the role of education, or the place of work in a human life. The mental shadow boxing on the subject of means and ends is a typical of those who are, uh, of the, who are the observers and not the actors and of the battlefields of life. In The Yogi and the Commissar, Kessler begins with the basic fallacy of an arbitrary dis, uh, demarcation between expediency and morality. Between the yogi, for whom the end never justifies the means, and the commissar, for whom the ends always justifies the means, Kessler attempts to extricate himself from this self-constructed straitjacket by proposing that the end justifies the means only within narrow limits. Here, Kessler, even in an academic confrontation with action, was compelled to take the first step in the course of compromise on the road to action and power. How narrow the limits, and who defines narrow limits, opens the door to the premises discussed here. The kind of personal safety and security sought by the advocates of the sanctity of means and ends lies only in the womb of yogism or the monastery. And even there is dark it, darkened by the repudiation of that moral principle that they are their brother's keepers. Bertrand Russell, in his Human Society and Ethics and Politics, observed that morality is so much concerned with means that it seems almost immoral to consider anything solely in relation to its intrinsic worth. But obviously, nothing has any value as a means unless that to which it is a means has value on its own account. It follows intrinsic value is logically prior to value as means. The organizer, the revolutionist, the activist, or call them what you will, who is committed to a free and open society is in that commitment anchored to a complex of high values. 
These values include basic morals of all organized religions. Their base is the preciousness of human life. These values include freedom, equality, justice, peace, the right to dissent, the values that were all banners of hope and yearning for all revo uh, revolutions of men, whether the French revolutions, liberty, fraternity, and equality, the Russians bred in peace, the brave Spanish peoples better to die on your feet than to live on your knees, or our revolutions, no taxation without representation. They include the values in our own Bill of Rights. If a state voted for school segregation or a community organi organization voted to keep blacks out and claim justification by virtue of the democratic process, then this violation of the value of equality would have converted democracy into a prostitute. Democracy is not an end. It's the best political means Sorry, sorry, Saul, I have to doubt. Available towards the achievement of these values. Means and ends are so qualitatively interrelated that the true question has never been the proverbial one, does the end justify the means, but has always been, does this particular end justify this particular means? <laughs>